Amen. Thank you, James and choir and band. Y'all give it up for some of them. They're leaving right now. They've been with us all morning today and uh, so blessed to have them faithfully serving. So it is pretty miraculous what Jesus did, right? I mean, Jesus came to the earth. He lived a sinless life. He went to the cross. And there on the cross, God the Father treated Christ the Son as if he committed all of our sin. So God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. Jesus was buried and resurrected. And then he showed himself to over 500 people before ascending into the heavens. The Bible says that he went and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. And it was there that the great coronation actually occurred. God the Father coronated Christ the Son, giving him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow, every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. All of this occurred. God the Father gave Christ the Son a kingdom and promised that Jesus would come again and establish that kingdom. Now you and I are living in what we could really call a parenthesis, a time frame between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And as we study the Gospel of Luke together, we've already been challenged in the area of taking advantage of our God-given opportunities. Because the way you and I manage our God-given opportunities today will determine our responsibilities when Jesus comes again. So we are going to have a job examination, a review, so to speak. For those of us who are genuine followers of Christ, we're not going to be reviewed based upon our sin. Our sin's already taken care of at the cross. That's a good place to say amen, right? But what we are going to be reviewed on is our service, our faithfulness to serve the Lord. That's why you and I have been challenged over the past few weeks to begin praying that our hearts would be broken with what breaks the heart of God. And so that's what we've been praying. God, break our heart for what breaks yours. And then as we are broken over what breaks the heart of God, God begins to birth within us both ministry and mission. Ministry to the body of Christ to actually help the body uh, grow. And then mission to those who are outside of the faith, enabling us and empowering us to actually make disciples of all nations. So that is the call. And as we are broken, God begins to place that upon us. And then we pray for courage, don't we? We need courage to move forward to do what God's called us to do. But we also know that whenever we are faithful to God, we face great challenges. Jesus faced it. You and I are following him, so we're going to face it. We're going to face questions. We'll face inspection, people eyeballing our lives to see whether or not we're the real deal. We'll also face opposition, people who are vehemently opposed to the mission of the New Testament church, which is to make disciples, that others might come to know Jesus Christ. But if you and I persevere, that is, if we continue, even in the midst of great opposition, there is a promise that there's fruit on the other side. So we want to remain faithful. And the Lord Jesus, when he comes again, will have an opportunity to say to you, as well as myself, well done, my good and faithful servant. So all of us long to hear that particular phrase from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you and I, listen are living in that time frame still right now. The time frame between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And we're going to get a warning from the text of Scripture this morning. Y'all ready for the warning? Say, yeah. So here's the warning. Make sure you do not become religious. That's the warning. Jesus is going to lay it out. And when I speak about being religious, I'm speaking about it in the strictest of terms, where you fall into a rut where you fall into routine, where you fall into ritualism, which you falsely assume the rituals are somehow making you right before God. Don't become religious. Y'all ever heard a preacher say that before? That's a good sermon right there, ain't it? Y'all just want to pray and go home on that? <laughs> but we're going to see how Jesus actually gives us the warning as we look at Luke's gospel again, chapter 20. So you've got your Bible, Luke chapter 20. Go ahead and stand with me in honor of God's word. Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 27. Now I'm going to read these verses and some of you are going to be like, what in the world is he talking about? Hang on, we're going to get to it, all right? So here we go, Luke's gospel, chapter 20, verse 27. The Bible says, there came to Jesus some of the Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection. So everybody listen, what do the Sadducees say? There is no resurrection. That's why they are sad, you see. 
That was legit. It got me through seminary, just letting you know. All right. Verse 28, so they questioned Jesus saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife and he is childless, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Now there were seven brothers and the first took a wife and died childless and the second and the third married her and in the same way all seven died, leaving no children. Finally the woman died also and in the resurrection therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot even die anymore because they're like angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. They did not have courage to question him any longer about anything. He then said to them, How is it that they say the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And therefore David calls him Lord. And how is he his son? And while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, now here's the warning, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectable greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at the banquets, who devour widows' houses and for appearances sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. The same context, chapter 21, he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. He saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins, and he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for all they gave was out of their surplus. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Let's bow together. Father, we do thank you for your word this morning and ask that you would apply it to our lives. God, we're living in the time frame awaiting your return. And we want to make sure that we're living in such a way that it honors you, that it bears fruit. So God, for us who are followers, I pray that you would strengthen us today. And for those who are outside of the faith and have not yet made a decision to follow you. God, I pray that you'd speak clearly to them, draw them to yourself, and we'll give you glory for it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and everybody said, amen. So you can uh, be seated. Now, this message really is one of those messages where you're going to be challenged to look into the mirror. I know some of you did that before you came to church this morning, but here's the second opportunity for you to look into the mirror. I'm going to give you three questions, and if you will answer these questions uh, truthfully, it will actually give you the answer to whether or not you are a religious person or whether or not you are living as a change agent in the culture in which God has allowed you to live. So there's three questions. You look in the mirror, ask them of yourself, just as I have as well. So here's the first question. Am I applying what God is teaching me? Am I applying what God is teaching me? Now, I know that sounds like a simple question, but we're going to see this in the life of the Sadducees. So the Sadducees were a religious group of individuals who wanted to make Jesus look foolish. That's why they began to question Jesus. They were seeking to put him into a corner, ask him a question about the absurdity of the resurrection in hopes that Jesus would deny the resurrection and kind of be camped out on their side. So they began to ask Jesus these questions. But who are the Sadducees? The Sadducees were not only a group of religious people, but they were highly touted as the individuals who believed the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They believed that God actually gave them those scriptures. They weren't too keen on the minor prophets or the major prophets, nor did they elevate the writings of the book of Psalms, the Song of Solomon, or uh, the book of Proverbs, the wisdom books. They kind of said, no, those aren't as important as the first five books of the Bible. Now, the Sadducees were really a liberal group if you compared them to the Pharisees. Or, yeah, the Pharisees. The Pharisees much more conservative. Sadducees did not uh, believe in the resurrection. They also didn't believe in angels, uh, nor did they believe in miracles. So they set all of those things aside, and they said, we do not believe in these particular events. So it's amazing here, as we look at the life of Jesus Christ, how they are asking Jesus about the resurrection when they don't even believe in the resurrection. But again, they're trying to make Jesus look foolish. So in verse 28, look at it again. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife 
And he is childless. His brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. Now, can we get a quick little witness on this right here? Aren't y'all glad we're out from under the Old Testament law? <laughs> Golly, that is crazy, ain't it? But this is known as uh, the Levitical marriage. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. The idea is simply that if a man has a wife, but he dies before the wife bears him a son to carry on his name, the wife is to marry the man's brother. Uh, they are to have children and thus continue the name of the deceased brother. So the idea was to keep the name uh, perpetuated on the earth. Verse 29 through 33, here's where it gets crazy. There were seven brothers. Remember, they're trying to put Jesus on front street with a the question. There were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died childless. The second and the third married her, and in the same way, all seven died. Can I just say, what's the common denominator of all these deaths? Y'all listening? <laughs> Don't tell my wife I said that. It was the wife, by the way. Are y'all listening? Some of y'all are like, what's going on right now? It's the wife. Leaving no children. And I love how the text reads. It's like, finally, the woman died too, right? What is this crazy lady's problem? <laughs> Question here in the resurrection, therefore, which one's wife will she be? For all seven that married her. Now, again, this is one of those uh, hypothetical questions that the Sadducees used to discount the resurrection. So they're trying to show Jesus uh, to be uh, an individual who really didn't believe in the resurrection or a little bit he was maybe off. But how did Jesus respond? Here's, here's what's awesome about Jesus. Jesus actually responded that people aren't married in heaven. People aren't married in heaven. Now, for those of you who love being married, I know that bums you out a little bit. For those of you who are having a rough time in marriage, you're like free at last, right? And so this is kind of the idea of what Jesus is getting at. Notice verse 34. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain that age in the future and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. So Jesus here is speaking of two ages. One of the ages in which uh, you and I live right now. The other age is the age to come after the resurrection of our bodies. Now one reason that people marry in this current age is to procreate. So the very reason that people get married, one of the primary reasons is to have children. However, in the resurrection, we do not need to have children anymore because we will never die. So there's no sense in procreating. Verse 36, he says, they cannot even die anymore because they are like angels, uh, sons of God, sons of the resurrection. Now notice here, just so we don't get any bad theology in our thought processes, whenever you die, you do not become an angel. Uh, that's actually demoting yourself. You will be elevated above the angels, and you will be eternal. You will be immortal. You'll no longer face death. That's why he's saying you'll be like the angels. That's what angels are. They're immortal, and you will be as well in the resurrection. Now, we are going to be raised immortal Listen, when our bodies are resurrected from the ground. Now, the question is, what happens if a follower of Jesus dies right now? Can we say it like this? Let's say I'm up here preaching, and all of a sudden I die. Are y'all with me on that? I said, by the way, that's been my prayer that I will die preaching, right? Y'all, I've seen so many people die while I was preaching. I may as well die myself. <laughs> that's like my third funny joke. But anyway, so... Uh, if I die and I just kill over up here on the platform, so my body's here, what's happening to me? Well, the Bible teaches that my soul is actually going to be with the Lord. You know, I read this in my uh, study, just devotion this past week. I'm reading the book of Genesis right now. And I actually read where Rachel died, and the Bible says that her soul left her body. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, we're told that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, so as soon as I breathe my last breath here upon the earth, my soul is indeed with the Lord. But my body, hopefully y'all will take it off the stage and put it in the ground, right? So you will bury my body. But when Jesus comes for the church in the rapture, the Bible teaches that those who are dead in Christ, their bodies will be resurrected from the ground to meet their soul in the air. So I have a glorified body in that moment, a body that is fit for eternity. Now, I'll also tell you that not only will followers of Jesus Christ receive resurrected bodies, but, and I know this isn't the primary teaching in the text, but I want you to know this, even those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, one day they will have resurrected bodies as well. For the Bible says that the dead will be raised up and stand before the Lord Jesus at the judgment. 
So the great white throne judgment. So they'll have bodies fit for eternity. But what Jesus is getting at here for these Sadducees is quite simply that people aren't going to be getting married after the resurrection. And then he goes on and he says it like this. And this is where you got to clue in to what's happening here. Jesus is fixing to teach that they have not yet applied biblical truth to their life. So where do we see that? Look at verse 37 again. The Bible says, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the burning bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, for we all live to him. Now, this is huge, all right? Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament books of the Bible, which the Sadducees claim to be the word of God, all right? So he's using that scripture to show them that they've not even applied what the scriptures teach. For indeed, whenever Moses had the Lord introduce himself, the Lord said that he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's saying it's not the God of those who are dead, but actually the God of those who are alive. So he, again, God the Father in the Old Testament, is affirming the resurrection. But here's what's crazy, all right? Now you got to stick with me because I'm headed somewhere. What's crazy is that they knew the scripture intellectually but they did not apply it to their lives. Now, this is the warning. They were unable to expose Jesus as foolish. Instead, they displayed themselves as arrogantly ignoring what the scriptures actually taught. Verse 39 through 40, the Bible says, Some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you've spoken well. They did not have courage to question him any longer about anything. So Jesus then teaches in verse 41, How is it that they say the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore David calls him Lord, and how is he his son? So two points are evident here. As Jesus quotes Psalm 110, first, David's son is also David's Lord. And David's son would be exalted to God's right hand. How would that exaltation occur? Unless there were a resurrection. And here again, Jesus affirms biblical credence to the resurrection. But the Sadducees just would not apply the truth to their lives. Now, here's where i got to have your eyeballs, all right? Because this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. If we are not careful, are y'all listening? Say yes. Am I? All right. If we are not careful, we can drift into growing in our knowledge of what God's Word teaches, but not growing in our application of its truth in our everyday lives. If we're not careful, we'll get together every single Sunday, and we will learn new truth, but not apply it. And so we can get together, and we can learn new stuff, and you can even come in here, and you can be like, I hope Levi really wows me this morning and teaches me something I do not know. But if you're not applying it, what difference does it make? See, biblical knowledge does not equal spiritual maturity. So it doesn't. Sadducees knew more Bible than anybody collected around Jesus in these days. But they weren't spiritually mature. So it doesn't matter how much you know, if you don't apply it, you are not honoring the Lord. Matter of fact, you can know a whole lot, which will make you very smart and very religious. And I've actually discovered that it's a lot easier to know something than it is to do something. So I want you to think, all right? You've got to put your thinking cap on now. What's the last? Are y'all listening? All right, here it is, here it is. What's the last truth the Lord taught you? What is it you can point back to and say, man, I remember God taught me this, all right? And then my question will be, did you apply it? See, see this is the thing, right? We, we come to church and we want to know more, find out more, and know, I, I'm not downgrading knowing the Bible. I am downgrading it, though, in comparison to applying it. We all want to learn new stuff, but it's like, have we applied what we've already been taught? Now, I've asked you to think, what was the last thing the Lord really taught you? Did you apply it? Now, if you're coming up empty and you're like, I can't think of anything that the Lord taught me. I, I can't remember anything. I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing up nothing right now. Listen, you could be very religious then. 
You would come to church every Sunday. Be relit. Routine. But no life change. Am I applying what God is teaching me? Can I tell you as a pastor, it is super simple to become religious. Easy peasy, man. I'm studying the Bible all week long. I'm learning stuff every single week. In my office, I mean, my mind's blowing up. Are y'all listening? I walk around the office, listen to this. Y'all got to listen. This is what the Lord just taught me, man. This is awesome. But if I'm not applying it, what difference does it make? And if I can get up here and y'all can leave and you can be like, we learned some new truth, but we're not applying it, then you're not going to look any different next Sunday than you look this Sunday. Y'all hear what? Y'all ain't heard preaching like this before, have you? All right, so that's the first question. Am I applying what God's teaching me? Here goes the second question. Am I experiencing continual inward change? Am I experiencing continual inward change? Continue to look in the mirror. All right, you're asking yourself that question. Am I experiencing continual inward change? See, religious people are externally vibrant, but internally they're unchanged. Uh, Religious people like cotton candy. They are puffed up, but they are empty. Look at verse 45 in your Bible. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to the disciples, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces, chief seats in the synagogues, places of honor at the banquet, who devour widows' houses and for appearances' sake offer long prayers. Notice what he says. These will receive greater condemnation. All right, This is huge. Jesus is calling them out. Uh, They like to be seen. That's why they dress the way they do. They like to be given special attention, so they love it when people bow down before them in the stores. It's like if they had a Walmart back then, and they walked in, they'd have these long robes on, everybody would see them when they came, they'd all bow down to these guys. They loved this. It honored them. It boosted their ego. They love to be important. They want to sit at all the special tables. They don't mind taking advantage of people either. They would take money from widows without any regret. They would line their own pockets with the finances of widows, and then they would walk around after spending all these finances talking about, look at how the Lord's blessed me. They love to be heard. The problem is they didn't love to be heard from God or by God. They wanted other people to hear, so they offered long and loud prayers, man, so that people would know they were praying. So Jesus says to them, they, and you've got to listen to this because this is huge, He says, they will receive greater condemnation. Did y'all hear that? That's massive, all right? It's one thing to receive condemnation. It's a whole other thing to receive greater condemnation. So why is it that the scribes, the religious people, are going to get greater condemnation? Here's the reason why. Because they knew more than anybody, but they did not apply what they had learned. You know what that is? That ought to be a strong warning for all of us up in here. Because what are we doing? We sit around all the time reading our Bibles, learning truth. But are we applying it? Kind of be like this. I I thought, what would it be like if Jesus were, you know, hanging out today and he kind of gave the same exact concept and he was talking to us? Uh, What what would he roll out? He'd be like, um, because, you know, we don't have Sadducees around, scribes, right? We still got religious folk. It's not in this manner. Jesus would be like, they get up on Sunday. They dress the best they can, they put on a happy face, they go to small groups. Then they enter the worship center, they sing, maybe so others can hear. They open their Bibles, they listen to what's being shared, try to act like all things are good. They take notes, even act interested in the preaching. They put some money in the offering plate, they volunteer to serve as long as they can be seen. They're not going to serve in the back stages. They shake some hands, then they head home. But they... Treat others like garbage at their house. He talks ugly to his wife. She talks ugly to the kids. They treat others like garbage at work. They backbite. They gossip. They treat others like garbage at school events. They make fun of. But then they show up at church again and they pray. And when somebody calls on them to pray, they pray long and loud. Did y'all catch this? Because here's the deal. What Jesus says about the Sadducees is that they love this, they love this, they love it. And then he says, and they devour the widows. They know all of this stuff, but they don't love people. 
See, it's a lot easier to know a whole bunch of stuff than it is to love people. So are y'all, y'all hearing me preach? So it's like we can call it, we can come up to church every Sunday and shake each other's hands. All right? And be like, man, I learned some cool stuff today. See you next Sunday. But then if you go back to your house and you are ugly and you are hateful and you act that way in the workplace, telling perverted jokes and cussing people out, and you act like that at school, ostracizing yourself from people because they ain't cool like you think you are, you, you telling me that's spiritual maturity? Not even remotely close. But you can quote some verses, can't you? <laughs> Y'all ain't listening. James says it like this, prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. Jesus said it like this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what he said, and I want you to look at me eyeball to eyeball. He says it like this, for those of you who hear this and obey it, it's like building your house upon the rock. And whenever the winds and the waves and the rain come and beat against the house, the house will stand because it's built upon the rock. But for those of you who listen, but you do not apply It's like you're building your house on the sand. And the winds and the rain and the waves come and they beat against the house and they tear the house down. You know what this means? This means that as we gather together, if we're not applying the truths that we are learning, then we are like the man building our house on the sand. And whenever challenges come into our life and whenever trials come into our life and then we fall out, so to speak, what do we give evidence of? We gave evidence we weren't ever applying the truth. Because when we apply the truth and the winds and the waves and the rain come and they came, by the way, to both of those houses, the one that stands was the one that applied the truth. The one that stands is the one who gives evidence that he's genuinely following Christ. It's only religious routine If all we do is go to worship and small groups and fill our heads with knowledge, but never actually experience authentic change. Been going to church every single Sunday. Tell me what the Lord's doing. Well, I don't, what do you mean? How is the Lord changing you, man? Well, I mean, I I was at church Wednesday night. No, no, that's not the question. How's the Lord changing you internally? Y'all remember Jesus, he pulled a cup up like this, right? He's looking at all the religious people. He said, you religious folk, y'all clean the outside of the cup real well. But on the inside, you're filthy. What everybody else can see looks legit. But what God sees is filthy. So I wonder if you're in here this morning and maybe Jesus said that to you. He'd be like, this is you outside the cup, man. You look like you got it going on. But God's looking at your heart. Religious on the outside of the cup, man. You come to church more than anybody in the whole church house. But inside, which is what God sees, you're filthy. Do y'all see the warning? Let me give you the last question. Here it is. Does my obedience to God display trust in Him? Does my obedience to God display trust in Him? Now, this is awesome, right? I'm, you know, let me kind of come down here with y'all on the, uh, the last little point if I can, right? So Jesus says, hey, hey, y'all look over there. See that? See what they're doing? See the religious people over there? I, I see y'all are looking. I'm, this is hypothetical. <laughs> I said, look over there, and they were going, where? Where? We're preaching. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do it up here. How about that? So look up here, right? There's the treasury, and there's the religious people. They're going, and they're giving money. They're giving out of their surplus. So here's what they did mentally. They thought about their budget. I thought about what they were going to give to the house of God. And they said, okay, here's my budget. Let me put this aside. Here's what I've got left over. Let me take some of what i got left over that's surplus and let me give it. All right? So they, they gave out of their surplus. You know what that means? That, that means that their gift did not really cost them anything. Sacrifice wasn't a sacrifice. It didn't change anything. All right, so here they, they give. And then Jesus is like, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, look at this lady right here, this poor lady. Two copper coins, all she got. Look at what she's doing. She's poor. And she's taking those two copper coins. She's throwing them in. And then here's what Jesus said. That lady gave more. Now, the, the text uh, actually says it like this. She gave more than all of the others combined. <laughs> now, if you could do math, you would realize that ain't true. 
But Jesus isn't counting the amount which is given. Jesus is looking at the sacrifice that was given. That's what he counts. Now here's the deal. The religious people gave of their surplus, which proved they didn't truly trust the Lord. Trusting in themselves. The woman gave out of her poverty, which proved she trusted the Lord. Are y'all listening to you? Now, this is true, right? So you come to church just like I come to church. We all come to church. The offering plate comes by. Some people give online. Are we giving in such a way that it actually costs us something? <laughs> I know how it is now. If you're visiting, right, this is your reason to check out, right? Preachers, that's all they ever talk about is money. But listen, really and truly, like I don't, right? Um, we just happened to go through the verses of the Bible, and it came upon us. It's Jesus' fault. All right? <laughs> And be blaming it on the preacher. But it's the truth, man. And I also started thinking, you know, God's called all of us to employ our spiritual gifts as well. But here's what we do. We look at our calendars and we think about all of our time. And then we say, okay, I, I, I'm going to serve the Lord if I've got extra time. Then I'm, then I'm going to serve. You know what Jesus is like? Jesus is like, hey, not impressed with that. Doesn't impress me. All right. I'm impressed with sacrificial giving, sacrificial living. Now, eyeball to eyeball, I'm closing her out. Here's where we live between the time frame of Jesus' first coming, his second coming. And as we live here, the warning is don't, and this is what we all have to be warned of, don't fall into becoming religious, getting into a routine, and not living in the context of what breaks the heart of God and with courage moving forward to advance the kingdom in ministry and in mission. And listen, if you're not helping that, then you're just religious. That's it. God's not called us to be religious. Y'all out there? That would have been a good place to say amen. So I'm going to say it again and give y'all a running start. Y'all ready? God has not called us to be religious, all right? And that's in the strictest sense, all right? So, man, I'm challenging with that. That'd be awesome, right? Could you imagine what it'd be like? This is, this is the end of the sermon, I promise. Could you imagine what it'd be like, though, if we all were like, we ain't going to be religious anymore. We're, we're going to follow hard after Jesus, and when he asks us to do something, we're going to do it. I can tell y'all are already nervous, ain't you? <laughs> Could you imagine? That would be awesome. That's when all of a sudden now God takes the body and we become change agents in the community to actually make an impact and influence and a difference, right? I guess the backside of that is we could all just get together and come to church every Sunday and shake each other's hands. What's up? How you doing? Good to see you. See you next week. <laughs> That's what Jesus died for? I don't think so. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning and ask that you would speak to hearts even now.